All right, let's get started. So today's topic is, of course, uh, top design tips on publication figures. This has been a popular topic that's been actually requested by all of you at the end of our other previous sort of themed webinars. So thank you so much for this wonderful idea. Keep them coming. In fact, next week we're going to be doing one specifically for graphical abstracts. So we've kind of split up the sort of uh, endeavors for making publication figures because we realize there are some, uh, you know, constrictions or limitations to creating multi-panel publication figures that kind of reside in the body of the text of the article uh, versus a graphical abstract, which is sort of a visual summary of your entire article, sometimes, you know, is positioned at the top of the article or gets shared on social media and is a little bit more of a bird's eye view of the entire story versus the sort of the nitty gritty data. So um, we will differentiate that. Of course, there's going to be a lot of overlap with the design tips we cover. So hopefully you'll pick up a thing or two throughout this webinar and you know across multiple webinars. So what we'll cover today roughly is again, the five easy to use tips for better, better publication figures. Um, I'll try to incorporate one or two sort of design demos so you can kind of see instead of just hearing the theory. And then we'll try to leave a little bit of time at the end for Q and A. Uh, so a little bit about ourselves. So actually, as I mentioned, have Joe on the line here, one of my colleagues. Uh, myself, if we haven't already met, my background is in uh, biological and medical illustration from the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. It's kind of a tongue twister. And then following that, I worked at National Geographic Magazine, uh, currently co-founding and working with a brilliant team of people here at BioRender. Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Joseph Zeppa. Uh, I got my BMSc and PhD from the Department of Microbiology and Immunology at the University of Western Ontario in London, Ontario, Canada. Uh, I then did a three-year postdoctoral associateship at the University of Pittsburgh under Dr. Joanne Flynn. And so for my PhD, I worked on group A strep, so more microbiology. And then in my postdoctoral associateship, I worked on the immunology of tuberculosis in a non-human primate model. And then kind of just having been a avid user of BioRender. Uh, I saw they were looking for somebody who could uh, look at the angle from the science side for them. So I joined on as a customer success manager and scientific uh, solutions consultant as well. So really happy to be here and to help you um, make your figures look as beautiful as possible using BioRender. Great. Thanks, Joe. BioRender is an amazing tool that allows people um, from all backgrounds, but primarily scientists and researchers, to very simply and easily create very beautiful, high-quality scientific images. Uh, so as I mentioned before, it's kind of designed for all sorts of individuals, from undergraduates, students, healthcare professionals, and it really helps with their ability to communicate science visually appealing. And the beautiful thing about it, and that I really loved kind of as a scientist, it requires little to no art background, of which I myself had none. And of course, as scientists, we're all super busy and we're all doing, uh, you know, our research and trying to do as much as uh, we can. And so the fact that uh, BioRender takes little to no time was also very appealing to me. Yeah, and so I think um, our, you know, goal in a snapshot is to give every scientist and scientific educator the tools and practical knowledge to visually communicate their research. And again, kind of previously as an academic researcher that really helped me made this transition um, was that fact in and of itself. And that's why I really loved BioRender and really wanted to join the team and help all of you communicate your research better. So again, um, some very common uses of BioRender. Number one that we normally get is publications, but I really wanna emphasize that BioRender can be used for a number of things such as presentations, either to an academic audience or to your team uh, in your lab meetings, um, in grant applications, uh, poster figures, uh, as well as experimental outlines and overviews. So pretty much whatever you can think to use BioRender for, we would love you to use it for that. Um, and of course, uh, we really look forward to seeing your amazing creations. Thanks so much, Joe. Um, so we're gonna sort of use these five tips or I guess five concepts as an anchor point to which we can kind of elaborate um, a little bit more. So it might seem like jargon to you right now. So hopefully in the next hour, it will you know, obviously resonate a little bit more. 
Generally speaking, we're going to cover, you know, color, layout, clarity, um, using proper fonts and labels, and um, how to ensure that you have enough contrast in your figure. So we kind of picked these out of, I think, the hundred that we could have covered just based on, I guess, the top mistakes that we've seen um, in the hundreds of publications we kind of surveyed. And of course, um, you know, from Joe's perspective, actually creating the figures themselves for publication. So the first tip we'll cover is color. Um, and I think generally speaking, we do like to talk about this a lot using complementary color schema uh, or color pick using the sort of little eyedropper tool in a lot of the softwares that you're already using. So looking at complementary colors, if you've taken one of our previous webinars, you've probably seen us talk about this. And that's the idea of using opposite colors or complementary colors. They're just two ways to say the same thing. Um, on our color wheel. So this is something you probably learned in grade one, you know, red and green are complementary or opposite colors, kind of the Christmas color schema. We do, we, we recommend um, kind of avoiding that color combination just for, you know, ensuring that you, that your colorblind audience can, can read your image. Uh, orange and blue is a very popular color combination, another complementary color set, as well as yellow and purple. So just keep that at the back of your mind as far as you know, when you're stuck and when in doubt, you go to use these color combinations. They generally work quite well. Here it is in practice. So looking at these sort of, um, you know, more elaborate, complex 3D images, if you add sort of a splash of the opposite color or the complementary color, in this case, uh, orange and blue with the bacteria, and it looks like there's a, uh, you know, kind of smattering of lymphocytes there. Uh, it really helps it stand out, as opposed to it having been maybe green for the bacteria or another shade of blue. Um, the orange and blue just kind of really kind of sing together really well. Same thing goes for purple and yellow. Those are a really nice color combination. And we don't quite know why. It's just very harmonious to the eye. And it's so sort of extreme of a color combination that it just ends up working out really, really nicely. So when you're looking at like complex data sets, sometimes it's, you can't really get away from using just two colors. You need to kind of show the whole variety uh, of variables that you wanna you know, plot on a graph. But if you can get away with it, um, sometimes what I like to do is use shades um, or variations of one color. If you're trying to show sort of antagonistic or opposing data sets on one graph. So again, blue and orange are really beautiful color combination if you can get away with it. Usually you have sort of a rate limiting factor where your images are primarily green if it's a fluorescence microscopy slide or um, you know some sort of brightly stained cell. You usually will have to then go and color pick those. But if you can get away with it, I would try to stick with this sort of complementary color palette as much as possible. And I just, I loved the way that the sort of red and blue carried through all, uh, I guess, how many is there here? six or seven panels all the way from A to G. And uh, I'm assuming that the blue and the red kind of correlate to the data and the plots um, and this sort of uh, genetic code at the top. I really like how that's kind of carried through as well as sort of how clear each label is. So the A, B, C, D, E, F, G is you know a larger font. And generally speaking, I think journal specifications do require this where you very clearly label your diagrams and then you kind of describe in detail in the figure caption. Um, but just ensure that the font is, you know, obviously much larger, it's bolder um, and consistently obviously capitalized or lowercase. And here is another really beautiful figure actually from Dr. Zeppa himself. So maybe I'll have him take over the, the mic again. Thanks, Jiz. Sorry, someone did bring up that uh, my audio quality might not be the best, so hopefully it's okay right now. Um, but if not, I apologize. So this is a, an older figure image that was uh, published in PLOS Pathogens. Uh, first author would be Dr. Catherine Casper, and uh, final author would be Dr. John McCormick. So this slide is really nicely put together. I really was proud of it when we put it out. Um, all, of the, so, so, uh, all of the images on the left, which were taken from our confocal microscope imaging software, are kind of beautifully aligned. Um, 
And then the top right is just an imported prism graph. And the bottom right is a heat map made by matrix2png.com. So you can see we can kind of incorporate a number of different technologies together. And I think we honestly just brought this together in a PowerPoint slide. So you're able to integrate uh, different uh, technologies there. One thing that was brought up to me, I love the color scheme that we brought all the way through, the red and the white and the blue. But one um, possible critique of this would be that, um, and that was brought up to me a couple of times now, was that, so in the left picture, the bacterium are red and the counter stain back is DAPI blue, which is the mammalian cells. And people thought that those color schemes held through all the way, held true all the way through. But in fact, the top right was actually now two different strains in the red and the blue. And then the bottom right was integrating different concentrations of the indicated cytokines on the left. So uh, although the color scheme was uh, definitely appealing to the eye, just be careful that people don't draw the wrong conclusions from your colors being brought through. So one critique could be that we may have wanted to change some of the coloring to indicate that there were differences in each of the panels. Yeah, that's really interesting. Thank you, Joe. And um, as Joe mentioned, I love the way this is beautifully aligned. Uh, one of the rare cases where I came to this and I couldn't really critique it because it was so beautifully designed. Um, but that's interesting, the one color uh, consideration there. Great. Um, here's a little technique. It is not specific to um, you know, necessarily multi-panel figures but it's a little kind of trick you can use in, this is BioRender specifically, but you know, Illustrator has it, I think PowerPoint has it, where you kind of color pick the font or the label of the thing you're labeling um, to the object. So in this case, the disintegrating microtubule, um, I was able to sort of remove the arrow, tuck in the word closer to the object, and then actually color pick to match uh, the label. So that's using fonts to match your objects, but this is uh, kind of across the board with graphical elements like, um, you know, numerical dots, or even for posters like this. So if you're using uh, more, again, graphical elements like squares or, you know, divider lines or even arrows themselves, symbols, um, if you use the color picker, that's exactly what it does. It just picks up the color of the background elements. And sometimes you can do that for micrographs. You'll just color pick the green or the red um, figure out what the hex code is. So the hex code is just an alphanumeric, that's sort of a universal color code. And then no matter what software you plug that into, you'll be able to pick up that color and you know, maybe change your um, you know, data color on your graph based on you know, the, the color in your photograph. So really what you're wanting to do is color pick and extract that hex code. Now it's not showing here, but if I were to double click that little swatch box, it would have shown that hex code in the pop-up. Okay, so that was a really quick breeze through of using complementary colors. And I'll go a little bit more into depth when we go through the live demo. So let's go on to number two of our five easy to use tips. And that is layout. I think this is probably one of the key factors in making a multi-panel image look really cohesive. So we like to use in the industry, in design industry, uh, guidelines and or boxes. And I'll explain what that means in just a second here. So looking at this really simple sort of, uh, you know, advertising poster kind of thing, um, we actually use a lot of guides and grids, again, built into software like Adobe Illustrator, PowerPoint, to really demarcate where margins and padding should be. Generally speaking, we like try to pick one unit, so maybe that's an inch or a centimeter or two, and then follow that all the way around your entire figure. So it might look a little bit crazy and it will definitely look overwhelming and checkered like this, but that's actually the idea. You wanna get all of your lines and grids in there, almost recreating um, grid paper in a way, but you know, only have it in the areas that are relevant. You've probably heard uh, me talk about this before, but uh, I can't get this image out of my head where I just picture uh, the little Pac-Man guy running through the margins and paddings of really good design. So a really well-designed poster, for example, another notoriously jam-packed uh, print limited kind of space. And uh, you know, with every poster, you have different segments or sections like objectives and methods and results. And so we always try to make sure that we have enough padding 
in between every element, whether that's in the rows, between the columns, under the figure caption. Yeah, exactly. You won't forget now with these kinds of visual analogies. So if you're kind of looking through your margins and you think, okay, the Pac-Man's going through and it's going to get stuck at this point because now one of my margins is skinnier than the other, then you have to go back and nudge it in. Um, here it is in practice. Actually, even with our medical illustrators who are masters trained and have a lot of rigorous training in design, we still do this in-house. So as Joe mentioned, BioRender is a online software tool. You can create figures, but we also have templates that you can create figures from. So you can base your new figures on some of our pre-made templates. But that means our templates have to be really good and almost foolproof for all of you to be able to go in and edit it. So we'll go through multiple rounds of kind of art critique amongst the team. And these are really fun because we kind of come together, we all give in our input, and we talk about how something can be better designed. And here's a real life example of a recent one we just published to our uh, library. So one of our artists put this together, um, very well laid out, very well researched, took a lot of time to get that together and distill it to seven steps like this with one call out. And we realized something wasn't quite right about it. And what we did, was we, we, we kind of boxed each step into a little sort of red box. And that really demarcates um, kind of, you know, why our eyes weren't quite uh, satisfied with the design. Going back here, it looked a little bit disjointed, but again, not quite sure why. We could have used grid lines, as we mentioned earlier, grid lines or boxes. In this case, we went with a boxes option where we put little boxes around each step to see, okay, where are its boundaries and you know, how much space is in between. It can be very deceiving if we don't have that box drawn around it. So from there, we kind of toggle the boxes around a little bit. Again, doesn't have to be perfect, but at least they're a little more aligned. You know, we brought the text from above and below to just below the figure here. So now it's the picture on top and caption below each step. And then, you know, when you remove the boxes, there's the after, there's the before. If I toggle those two, after, before, after, much cleaner, much more dense within each step. That's the real, um, I guess, take home message here is a lot of the times we see that images are okay to be dense as long as each step is dense in itself. And then in between you have enough room, again, that whole sort of Pac-Man walking around the aisles uh, visual. If that's, if that's clear enough, then you've done your, you've done your job. So that's the after, that's the before. So this was another image we did actually at yesterday's webinar. We did a bit of a figure makeover. So I won't go into the details of how we turn this into a more clear sort of linear flow. But this was a real life example uh, from a PI out at the University of Washington. If you'd like to see how we created this from beginning to end in the after version, um, it, the YouTube sort of video will be published on our uh, YouTube channel. So you can go ahead and look at that. Um, but here it is, it, it, you know, very beautiful graphics, but a little bit uh, difficult to follow as far as, you know, left to right, up to down. It kind of bends around in this kind of Y-shaped uh, format. So here was the after that we came up with. A little bit more linear. We took advantage of, uh, you know, lines and arrows. Uh, we also unified where the text appears on top or below those images. You can think of each little step as its own figure with its own little figure caption. And you've made very clear what is step one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So here's the before, here's the after. So hopefully we've done a good job of convincing you that you, know, you really have to condense your information in each step, but then make sure there's enough space in between each step. Like so. Okay. Um, here's an example of a figure that I uh, thought was really beautiful. It was actually, um, this one was in the ACR journal, Cancer Immunology. 
and um, the topic was repression of expression of cytotoxic T cell effector genes. So really interesting article. If you want to go ahead and read that, there's the URL below. And what I did was I thought, okay, this might have just needed a little bit of a nudge here and there to make it a little more readable. Um, you know, they do have clear demarcations of A, B, C, D, E, and F. If you can find the F, it's a little bit hidden. Um, but you don't want the kind of where's Waldo feeling of, you know, what is the next step? In things like this, where you've probably experienced this before, you have a lot of data to show in a small amount of space. Um, as Joe always talks about, there's you know, a lot of restrictions with journal uh, submissions, so you really have to follow those guidelines. And then you do feel restricted in the space that you have to work with. So um, you know, generally the eye is going to be craving some sort of order and categorization and room to breathe when they see figures like this. Um, so what I did was I kind of did their so you know box technique here and I boxed around each step just you know very very roughly to see okay where are there too much white space or you know where can we afford to add more things so around the F down here there is some empty space and then where are things getting a little bit crammed I'm seeing a lot of this sort of area in the center where the differentiation between B C and D is really thin. So um, now what I did was I kind of chopped this up into pieces in Photoshop and then redesigned it so that it was realigned. It really took, you know, very minor adjustments to make this really legible. So here's the before and here's the after. And again, it's a really subtle difference, but sometimes this is what takes something from, you know, not quite legible and frustrating to read to, you know, really beautiful and professional looking. So removing those labels and then adding those um, alphanumeric kind of sequences back in. I made the letters really bold because I like when the numbers um, are really, really clear. It's almost like running a marathon without knowing where the sort of five kilometer marks are. It's really hard to get into a story if you don't know where you're gonna end up. So I think this is really nice when you can bold as much as possible um, the letters or the numbers. Generally speaking, I think it's um, A, B, C, D. So hopefully that's helpful. Okay, so that was all about layout. Going to number three here is about clarity. Um, this was a number one requested comment when all of you um, asked for us to run this webinar was how do I accompany, you know, data, photos, complex images with simple schematics? Um, now, this isn't always possible based on the complexity of your topic, but generally speaking, you can probably boil it down to some sort of gross anatomical um, overlay or structure or comparison to a photograph or a complex data set. So um, we've had a few examples in the following slides that I hope will resonate with you. Um, so I showed this because working at National Geographic, we were definitely no stranger to uh, complex amounts of information in a small amount of space. Um, this was an incredible feat but with a huge team. It was very collaborative. Um, I can definitely not claim uh, you know, any credit for uh, you know, this, I guess the, the, the individual pieces, the, um, you know, the beautiful painterly effects. This was my co-artist that did this, um, but I helped with sort of the scientific illustration portions, including the overlays, and the textures and um, sort of the simple schematics that went with this. And of course our cartographers went into the middle and did all of their magic there with the uh, migration patterns of all of these beautiful species. So how do you condense that amount of information into one single pane like this for audiences that are actually between ages five to say 95? Um, so what we did was, you know, in accompaniment to the complex graphics. We just threw in some really simple schematics, literally just drawn in Illustrator A, B, C, D, E, F in a cyclical format. This is specific to this European eel. Same thing with this shark. We thought, okay, it'd be cool to show the brain and the sort of, um, it's called ampulla of Lorenzini, but it's actually sort of these little um, you know, sensors in the nose area, we thought, let's just kind of make a little cross section to show the schematic version of what that would look like internally. So sometimes the schematics are really what can tell the story. 
uh, much more than sort of the eye candy, although, you know, the eye candy is important as well. So just kind of a little parallel example there. Um, this was actually part of my thesis work at uh, Johns Hopkins. I was working with Dr. Jeremy Nathan's lab. And uh, this specific article that we made figures for was talking about the function of frizzled one and two genes in organogenesis, for those of you that are familiar with that uh, gene and mutations. Um, this included ventricular, the ventricular septum formation and the neural tube formation. So this was a really image heavy, data heavy article. These are just four panels that I've selected and I think it went up to, you know, panel O, um, PQRS. It was, it was pretty uh, visual intense. Um, and the complexity of this story was that, you know, during mammalian development, several similar events happen where tissues kind of must come together and fuse just at the right time. Otherwise, you end up with sort of non-closure defects, um, including ventricular septal defect. As you might know, it's, it's sort of a hole in the heart that you're born with. Uh, neural tube defects, cleft palate, diaphragmatic hernia, all those things that um, are kind of, you know, potential correlations to this genetic mutation. And so we thought, how do we unify this all and to show somebody in sort of a bird's eye view? Um, we came up with this sort of, almost looks like a coloring book of formation. And um, it really ended up being the style that was the most effective. So we could have shown every organ in 3D in a really more complicated way. But I think this was a bit more of a way to sort of um, show that, you know, unified way across multiple organs um, to show that, again, the potential correlation across the whole body. So sometimes a schematic like this can really help to accompany your other figures for your editor to kind of just rest their eye on. And then, you know, beyond just submitting your actual audience who's going to be reading this. Great. Okay, and again, I'll show a little bit more of how you can accompany data with schematics as we go through the demo. And we're making pretty good time here. So uh, let's jump to number four. So fonts and labels. That, actually. Yeah. I was just wondering, somebody brought up a great question. Um, mm -hmm. They were asking, what can you do if your panels don't fit together into a square or rectangle? Do you have any oh. tips or tricks for something like that? That is a great question, yes. Um, I've done a couple of tests thinking that one of you might ask that. <laughs> And it, I realize it is still possible to somehow uh, put it in a box, even if it's a circle or really like unusual organic shape, it will certainly somehow fit within uh, you know, a box shape. So I would encourage you to try it. Um, happy to look at sort of one-offs if you'd like to submit. Um, we'll give an email at the end there that you can submit to. But I, as far as I've seen, I think it is possible to put it in a box and then move that box around. Um, I will show maybe in the demo part, however, if, um, if that resonates a little bit more visually. But that is a great question. You can also try to use the grid system or the guideline option if you can't, if the box method uh, doesn't quite work for your figure. But great question. So moving on to fonts and labels, um, I think the main thing here is to really create hierarchy using fonts and labels. Fonts and labels is a really, really big topic. I think there are people that specialize in this at major news uh, you know, agencies and ad agencies. Uh, but I think the take home message for this specifically today would be to focus on creating hierarchy. So an image like this, it's pretty obvious you're reading up to down, and probably the largest font first, and then the smallest. But it's really interesting because you can literally manipulate the way somebody is going to approach your figure based on the size of the font, the boldness, uh, the font itself. In general, of course, I think, again, a lot of journals have their specifications to use sans serif fonts like Arial, uh, Proxima Nova, uh, I'm sure you can, guys can shout out a couple of others that are pretty, pretty popular. Um, I think the more monospace or courier type fonts are recommended for amino acid sequences 
or um, you know labeling genes, but um, for the most part, I would stick to sans serif fonts, and then really focus on hierarchy of text. Hierarchy of text also relates to the ability to again really obviously number your steps from one to ten, A to Z. Uh, this is a strong exaggeration and. Um, you know, something that we actually use a lot in the sort of infographic world. I think infographics is kind of like getting a boot camp on how to design because, again, it's really placing emphasis on data and text as well as picture. They all get the same um, level of respect and spacing. And again, a lot of the times, the way that you can capture your audience is to just really clearly walk them through the story from one to 10, A to Z. And that means you, know, you have to have a nice um, sort of legend or typeface or consistent way to number things. Um, in this case, you probably look at the numbers first and then the words. So that's great if you're really trying to show from a bird's eye view how many steps you have in your figure. But I just like to look at infographics as a bit of an inspiration on how to set up complex data sets. Here's another infographic. Again, a lot of information being shown here, but I bet you that you've probably looked at the numbers first and then the city names and then maybe the map in the middle and then perhaps the little captions underneath each, each city. So they've done a really good job here of making you follow your eye from one to seven. They could have made the number really, really tiny. Um, of course, this specifically was saying the seven best cities to find a job. Um, so the one to seven was very important in this case because it actually has a ranking instead of like a, a temporal order. But uh, yeah, just keep that in mind. I look to infographics for inspiration and then apply those to scientific imagery. Here's another example. I'd say that the contrast here is not that great for this figure but um, they've done a really good job in this sort of extreme text hierarchy where the title and the main idea of the story is the biggest, boldest, um, really confidently in the middle. And then uh, the accompanying text is quite small. And it could be kind of scary to have to scale text to that degree and that amount of contrast, but it really does work. If you can get away with it in your figures, um, I'd recommend testing it. So basically, don't use the same font size for everything that includes, you know, heading, subheading, labels, and body text. Uh, here's a sort of simplified example. Again, um, you know, numbering from one to five using these little circles around the number if you can get away with it. I'm not sure if any publications allow for that. And then again, this is the example I showed previously of, you know, the numbers being very clear the subheadings or the headings for each step is bolded. And then of course the text below is much smaller. I would even go as far as changing the label. So this IgM, IgG antibody label to be even italicized or a slightly different font or even a different color than the body text itself. So that's text hierarchy. Um, Oh, this is another of your examples, Joe, I believe. Oh, yes, this was a, a recent um, a figure in a nature paper, paper that was just published with uh, Dr. Joanne Flynn Lab at the University of Pittsburgh, Maria Roederer and Bob Cedar at the NIH. And a big shout out to Trisha Dara, who is the um, kind of the mastermind behind a lot of the data and a lot of the figures. Yeah, so I feel like it does uh, a good job of lining up a lot of data like an A, um, accompanied by a beautiful 3D rendered PET CT image to the top right with some beautiful contrast of that orange on the teal background. And then kind of really nice color coding. So all the colors on the bottom, C, D, E, uh, all the way through H, all the colors correspond to different treatment groups, um, as well as, um, you know, standardized uh, circles for each individual uh, sample, as well as um, the color coding again. So. Yeah, I just thought um, this was a great example of how to organize a lot of data into kind of beautifully organized rows and including kind of um, kind of an odd misshapen picture to the top right. We obviously didn't have the same number of samples in each group in the top right, but we kind of filled in the background with a bit of black space. 
So we were able to make that nice square so that it would fit into the figure. Yeah, it's really beautiful. Thank you for sharing this. Um, I love how bold and clear the alphanumerics are. So um, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, very consistent. I even love the color um, in the X axis here, the color options there, how it matches the data that it's labeling, so beautiful. And then serendipitously, the, the images themselves, the photograph has um, orange and blue, which is ha it just happens to be complementary, and I think that's probably what really makes it sing. Uh, we do have a couple questions about where did you construct your graphs? I think, yeah, they're, they're so beautifully aligned. Uh, the X and Y axes labels are not too, you know, humongous or jarring nor overlapping. Um, yeah, so these graphs were built in, in Prism. So it is a paid software oh, okay. uh, graphical application. Yeah, and the statistics were also performed uh, in Prism as well. And so, yeah, you're able to kind of grid out your, um, each of those figures um, in. They have a layout builder. But I think because the top right picture was actually exported from our PetCT imager, I think at the end of the day, we did have to bring this all into an actual PowerPoint uh, folder so that we could slot everything in together, including the top right image. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Joe, for sharing. Great. Okay. And final, last but not least, um, this is something that we probably preach at every single webinar, just so that it gets drilled into your head um, about converting to grayscale. And that is to really, you know, kind of elucidate where your contrast is, uh, you know, strong enough or maybe lacking in your figure. So this is kind of a quick example I like to show where color can be very deceiving. We indeed have two different colors here of orange and green overlaid. Uh, but if you swap it to grayscale, it's a very kind of sobering reality that uh, a lot of colors are actually very similar in color value. So it ends up being that you'll lose your audience's um, kind of attention or even uh, legibility if they have some sort of color blindness. If it ultimately gets printed in black and white, you'll also lose that information off the bat. So basically the take home message is, don't stack parts of an image that are close in color value. So again, you know, swapping those two square swatches to grayscale, you'll see that it immediately disappears. Um, and again, can be very deceiving because colors, they, while they look different, if the value is very similar, um, you get, uh, the information gets lost very quickly. So if you drop down one of those color swatches like this, either in things like Google Slides or PowerPoint or Adobe or even um, even by render, there are these sort of color options that tend to be the same value. So the red circle is kind of to say, don't do this. Um, and then this horizontal circle here that I'm showing, that's more so the color options you wanna pick. It ends up being that you might pick an orange and a blue. If you look the other way, it'll go sort of purple and yellow. So basically try to overlap light on dark, dark on light with enough contrast in between. And here's an example of very typical, you know, cytosol that's, you know, dark with some foreground elements on top. If you, again, swap it to grayscale, uh, you'll, need, you'll see right away that you're losing some of that contrast in the arrows, the labels, something that you wouldn't have immediately noticed without it converted to grayscale. Um, if you want to download that sort of uh, Chrome extension, I think other browsers have it too, where it'll actually just convert your entire browser to black and white or your desktop, that's a nice little handy tool as well. We actually do have a option in BioRender to preview in grayscale as a nice little gut check to see if your figure has enough contrast. So here it is swapped, um, you know, lightened the site as all so that, uh, you know, it does look like there's an internal and external environment with that very light shade of blue, but it's not dark, dark so dark that you can't see, you know, the, the foreground elements. So again, convert to grayscale as kind of the rule of thumb. Um, here it is a speed through and practice if you haven't already seen uh, this GIF or GIF playing in a previous webinar. A lot of the times um, you're gonna show sort of overlays on top of nuclei on a cell because you know, they obviously stain darker. 
So representationally, we make nuclei very dark, but that means that things that you layer on top tend to get lost. So you have to be very careful about when you throw on a DNA or you know, a transcription protein or even a label like this apoptosis, it's gonna have enough contrast. So in BioRender, we use there's a before and after. And again, we use the preview in grayscale just to give a gut check to see, is this gonna be legible? If not, let's bump up the contrast. Let's change the color of the DNA, even knock back the, the, the opacity or intensity of the background elements, and then do a final gut check in grayscale. So the, this is a bit of a fast speed through, and I'll show a little bit slower in the demo, but um, hopefully this, this will be uh, memorable. Okay, so not quite done yet. We got probably a good 10 minutes here before we can wrap up. Um, so I will show you, uh, I guess, in a demonstration, how I would there, combine. My apologies. There was one yeah. quick question in regard to um, kind of. Oh, I think, did your audio cut out there? Uh, what, what recommendations could you give for an odd number of figures like that after you've boxed them into squares? Oh, interesting. Um, so I think your audio cut up for a second. Which, which box were you referring to? Which oh, image? Oh, my apologies. If it was like a panel mm -hmm. um, of six different figures, if you only had five, though, and you couldn't organize it into like a nice, beautiful three by two. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think if I were doing it for, say, a client, I'd probably start to move things around and find a way to fit it in. For example, this is an odd number. I think this is seven in this figure. Um, but I think we, the way that we rearranged it, we were able to fit that in. Sometimes you could even fudge it a little and then start to add in the caption or labels to the right or to the left or below it. So there are ways to manipulate the figure so that you can um, satisfy it. So here's kind of a good example of that. If you see below in the before, this needle was pointing up towards the mouse, but it didn't quite fit for our uh, composition. So in the after, we flipped it to be on top and then shrunk down the size of the mouse a little bit. So there are some things here. This is actually a nine step process with this uh, ninth one hanging off the edge there. So we made the conscious decision to make this not its entire full step and give it the integrity of the other steps, but kind of gave it an offshoot. So you can see that the pictures have the caption on top, but for this little side step one, we put the caption to the side. And you probably didn't notice that when you looked at it, you probably weren't offended by the fact that we, we moved it around a little bit, but that is a way that you can kind of manipulate some of that layout a little bit if you're, if you're struggling to fill that space. Um, but space isn't necessarily a bad thing if the rest of your image is, is uh, working out well. I think this was also a good example of that. Um, you know, there's still some space on the right here and the left of the last three, but it still somehow works. So again, you don't have to have perfectly, you know, parallelogram uh, squares next to each other. Um, as long as it's, you know, you've got enough room for uh, that kind of Pac-Man to move all the way around. That's kind of the rule of thumb that I'd stick with. But yeah, that is a really great question. And it is case by case basis, so it's hard to say universally, but I'd, I'd definitely try those out. Yeah, great questions, by the way. Um, to finish off here, I just wanted to give a quick preview into BioRender. As I mentioned, we won't go into the full details or the nitty gritty of how it works. Um, but for those that don't know, this is the BioRender interface templates on top that I mentioned that you can use as a starting point. In fact, here's um, one of the sort of similar figures that I mentioned, that template that we put together. And then in below, this is sort of all my illustrations and it's a little messy, so I apologize, but um, kind of gives an idea of the range of figures you can create. And um, I'm gonna just pop open this figure that was started. So multi-panel, nice kind of, uh, I guess, marriage or mirroring of anatomy with histology figures and some kind of mock data sets that I've kind of thrown along the bottom here. Um, the first thing I'd probably do is go in and start adding my little grids. 
So again, just pick one unit. It doesn't really matter what it is, nor does it have to be perfect. I'm just going in and adding very rough guidelines, so if you can see that. Oops, sorry, I'm just gonna move away the Zoom chat here. I don't think you all can see it, but okay. So there's my sort of border on the edges. This just you know allows me to be a little bit bold with how I place my objects without being afraid of it getting cut off on the edges or you know looking a little bit strange. Um, I'll probably also kind of align and distribute these images a little bit more carefully. So if this is as far right as I want it to go, and this is as far left, I'll probably select all four, distribute it evenly, and then I think every app has this option, by the way, uh, and then align it. So there we go. And I'm probably going to want to find, if possible, some sort of uh, graphical representation of the thing below. So I guess this, you know, definitely depends on the audience level. Um, you obviously want to capture your audience without going too simple, but you'd be surprised just how nice the schematic representation of the data is really, really nice and, uh, you know, it helps tell your story. Use that one there. And these are all vector based. So if I zoom right in, you're not going to see a single pixel, which is really nice. And right away, you probably captured your attention of your audience a lot more than, you know, just the data sets there. Um, I'm going to do a quick sort of contrast check here, preview and grayscale. And it's looking pretty good. Looking below here, I think one of my graphs is kind of losing clarity. I think the color combination that was used is a little too light compared to the others. In fact, sometimes I'll even zoom out and exaggerate the size at which it'll probably and be in final print. Because if you're way in close like this for the rest of your figure making endeavors, you're not going to catch that right away. Zooming out really kind of helps. It's kind of like when you're oil painting, if any of you are painters, um, it's almost like a workout. You're literally constantly stepping in, stepping out to see what it's going to look like if it were presented in a gallery or looked at it from a distance. Or in this case, printed smaller and amongst a heavy body of text. So if I zoom way out, we are indeed losing some of that clarity. So I'm going to go ahead and come out of preview mode. And then that might just mean that I have to go back to my, you know, graphing software and edit that data to be a little more clear. In this case, I'm just going to, you know, change the circle color that I don't think this is how you're going to put your data together, but just for the purpose of this demo, even this line, if it's important. There we go. And then I'm going to hit preview again, looking pretty good. So again, grayscale, great way to unify and eliminate color as a variable to get that in shape. Okay. So there's kind of a, a sort of simplified way to combine, you know, data with photographs, with schematics. You can imagine many different ways to do this. If you have a brain, maybe a coronal section of a brain next to a schematic of a brain. You can do that in BioRender as well. And because you necessarily can't manipulate the photos, um, I would generally tend towards marking up the schematic, of course, versus marking up uh, the image. So sorry, this might be a little bit nonsensical, but for the neuroscientists in the room, this might be a cool little trick. So kind of grab a schematic that's similar, if not exact same, image of what you're representing in the photo or the micrograph or the radiograph. Um, and if there's an area of interest, sometimes I'll just go in and, you know, highlight that region, whether it's the nuclei of the brain or, you know, just the, the area of damage. And you can do this in Illustrator as well, of course. There you go. 
And last trick, I'll usually knock the opacity down so you can still see through a little bit. Maybe I'll throw in a line or an arrow. We didn't go into arrows uh, and how to label in detail in this webinar. And then maybe you want you know, to show a micrograph of that area, but just an example of how you can kind of pair schematics with photos to really kind of get your user's attention or reader's attention right away. Okay, so this is kind of a nonsensical figure, but hopefully it kind of shows you the, the different types of techniques you can use to accomplish this sort of combination figure type. Great, okay, so with the last few minutes here, I'm gonna just jump back to Byrender, or sorry, to uh, my slide deck, see if there are any outstanding questions. Um, I'd happy to be happy to field any now, if there were any repetitive questions here that weren't answered, or perhaps ones that were unable to be answered by our team. A um, couple of questions. What format can you upload your figures in BioRender? Um, so within BioRender, you can upload a JPEG, a PDF, an SVG, which is a vector-based file. Um, did I say PNG? JPEG? Yeah, so those are the four types, I believe. Um, so hopefully that's helpful. And you can see you can, be, you can get really creative in the combination of the types of figures. And can you import your CT scan image into Byrender? You certainly can, as long as it's one of those file types. So again, a JPEG, a PNG, PDF. Um, I don't think it would be an SVG, but again, you can upload SVG files. Um, is there a tool in Byrender to make sure that the spacing between panels is even? Um, what I like to do is the distribute function. So if this was way up here, and I wanted these three to be distributed evenly, I would go ahead and pick distribute, I guess, or horizontally distribute in this case. And then I would align either center or below. <clears throat> uh, you can't quite import chemical formulas yet into BioRender, um, but we will be working on the next several months. So stay tuned for that for sure for the chemists and biochemists in the room. Great questions. Um, PDD icons you can upload. So if that's important to your story, all you have to do is plug in the PDD ID, and then you can manipulate the 3D structure within BioRender. Sorry, this is becoming a BioRender tutorial now for those <laughs> who may already know about BioRender. But um, this is sort of a new handy tool that we've uh, implemented in the app so you can kind of color it to your heart's content um, style it you can choose the structure so um, really cool way to add kind of a splash of 3d into your figure if it's a primarily 2d structure and of course if the 3d structure is important and you want to highlight a certain region or residue you can use this Like so, um, let's see that. So yeah, if this is important to your story, you can certainly use the PDB plugin. So we're getting asked, how do we actually make the individual vector icons? That's a great question and very happy to run a tutorial on that just how to draw an illustrator. Um, it'll probably have to be a two, three year master's degree in medical illustration condensed in a 45 minute tutorial. But there are certainly simple concepts that can be covered, like you know, using the brush tool, pen tool, pencil tool. Um, as evil as Adobe Illustrator feels, it is obviously the most powerful tool for creating like really detailed vector icons like this. So if you're uh, erring on the more expert side of the science illustration spectrum, then we'd be very happy to run a webinar like that if it's interesting to you. Yeah, it looks like there is some interest in that. <laughs> okay, great. So we're just coming 
over on time now, so we'll sadly have to part ways, but I'm going to throw up this slide for those of you who don't have a Barrender account yet. As always, you're more than welcome to try out the free version. It's free forever for educational purposes, for presenting, um, for giving lectures. And uh, we do have a few more upcoming webinars. As I mentioned, next week we're doing one on graphical abstracts. So that'll be a little bit more about saving space, using schematics, usually a little more restrictive, which is, um, I know Cell Press has a five inch by five inch kind of restriction for their graphical abstracts. So it's a little more, it's a little different than the sort of publication multi-panel considerations. So thank you so much for joining us and thank you to the Byrender team for tag teaming this with me today. And I hope you learned a thing or two. Thanks so much. Thank you, everyone.